called my, I changed the name of my presentation. There's, you can use my chair here. Anybody want to see? It's warm. <laughs> I changed the name of my presentation to When Mother Earth and the Father who art in Heaven live together. I want to share with you a story that happened to me two years ago on a trip to Machu Picchu, Peru. Just to illustrate ecotheology, the link between our faith in God and the ecology. Ecojustice, seeking ecological justice together with social justice, and eco-spirituality, a spirituality that grows out of a close connection with the earth. Three ecologically sensitive theologies that are available to us to sustain, inspire, guide, and support our work to care for and heal the earth, including ourselves. We may not all share the same faith, but I think that we do all share a concern for the earth. She's suffering. to stop what is still stoppable, or maybe to prepare ourselves in a pastoral way to respond to what may be coming. I hope that as you hear these stories, you can find your own eco-theology and what may be helpful and inspiring to you, to your work, your work in the church, in the community, or your own eco-spirituality. I was on a train going to Machu Picchu. I looked at the snowy mountains before us, and I tried to open my window to take a picture, but I can't open it. The husband of a tourist sitting in front of me, we were looking at each other, sees me struggling, and decides to help me open the window. They were from Europe. Their guy was sitting to my right, and she was a Peruvian woman. After a while, the spider begins to hang by the web outside of my window. As the train moves, she begins to rock back and forth with the wind. When the young tourist woman notices the spider, she makes a gesture of disgust big enough for all of us to see. To calm her down, I say with signs not to worry that the spider doesn't bother me. And if he was going to jump on anybody, it would be me, since I'm in the direction of the wind. But her tension remains. I keep enjoying my view and the freedom to see the snowy mountains before us. But all of a sudden, with an individualistic impulse, the woman stands in front of me and closes my window, as if it was hers. I tell the guy, please tell her that I'm not bothered by this spider. And I try to open my window, but I can't. Naturally, I look at her husband without thinking what I was just doing. And he looks at me with shame and stands up and opens my window. I try, but now it is very hard for me to enjoy the mountains again. The spider continues to rock back and forth with the wind. Nobody can now ignore I was having my own spiritual experience with the mountains and with this battle. But another story began to unveil. All of a sudden, now from my right, the tourist guy gets up in front of me with a napkin. I quickly think, well, maybe to just push off the spider so he stopped his free ride to Machu Beach. But instead, the Peruvian guy grabs the spider and crushes it against the wind. I think the road to Machu Picchu is witness again how the fear to the unknown and the ignorance of the other sometimes kills. When we arrive to Aguascalientes, the town from where you take another minibus which will finally take you up the mountain of Machu Picchu, 
there was a shy discussion going on between the county officials and the artisans of that place. The problem, the selling of bottled water. A bilingual sign reads shyly at the entrance saying, Prohibido traer botellas de agua a Machu Picchu. That means prohibited to bring water bottles to Machu Picchu. And in its background, there is a picture of a Machu Picchu littered with bottle waters. While the officials with their TV cameras, reporters, and a man dressed up in a bear costume smiled to us tourists, the artisan women angrily asked the officials in Spanish, if we're not allowed to sell water, how are we going to feed our children? And why didn't you start by prohibiting the Coca-Cola first from bottling the water instead of coming to us the poor to abandon our livelihood? So I thought, the poor wonder why officials came to close their open windows and to crush them with insensitive laws written on paper. A woman who worked at the station, as the people debated, quietly hid the sign of a dirty Machu Picchu. She knew it was impossible to ask us tourists to not bring bottles of water with us if people were selling them to us in Sula Cusco and right there in front of the cameras. Back in Cusco, I spent two more days in a small town called Guayacoche, an indigenous community outside of the city. I went there to stay with the families to know about their livelihoods, customs, spirituality, and values. I went to Peru to teach a course on ecotheology to a group of seminary students. And there was no other way that I could teach them unless I allowed the place to teach me first. I got to grace. That first day I arrived to spend a couple of days with the familia, with the Quechua family. They were involved in hosting an Inca wedding. The groom was the great grandson of an Inca king from the Chinchinchi Rock. The event was a great celebration, full of colors, all kinds of dancers, dances, typical dresses. There was acoustic instruments being played, music, processions, and offerings, offerings to the Pachamama, baskets of corn and coca leaves as presents for her, Mother Earth, and the Abus, the mountain spiritual guides of People. The ritual was all in Quechua, language, and everyone in the family participated regardless of whether they understood what was being said. The reality too is that most of the young people no longer know how to speak Quechua. Even though at first, at first glance, all seemed harmonious, Later, when I approached the musicians to congratulate them, tell them how much I had enjoyed the whole celebration, I learned that these type of ceremonies were rare in Peru. Small towns need to bring dancers and shamans, spiritual leaders now from the larger cities where they have moved, so people in the small towns could have the other normal celebrations, and so the shamans can also help with the rites. Realization of the event arrived to a stop when the musicians also added, and tomorrow is the religious wedding at Cusco's Cathedral. Confused with their statement, I asked them, wasn't this the religious wedding? And they said, no, this one was the civil wedding. The judge was there next to the shaman. The religious one is tomorrow at the church. And so I began to wonder, when did the windows of God's temple begin to be shut to define an act of faith and love outside of his walls as civil and an act of faith inside as religious? The next day, as I said, I went to Cusco's Cathedral and there I found the second way. There weren't that many colors. Now gold, black, and white were predominant. There were no dancers. People sat in their pews. 
The songs were sang by a choir that no one could see, accompanied by electric instruments, while the mariachi band did away for them outside of the temple. There were offerings, yes, but not made out of corn or coca leaves. There was wheat bread and wine, golden coins, rings, and grapes. It was no longer the family members or the dancers who brought the gifts, but the couple themselves who would bring them to be administered and blessed by the church. The church, not the Pachamama or Mother Earth, but the church of God, the Father who art in heaven. The intentions shared and the needs of the couple were still the same as the day before. Prosperity, a long life together, and a blessing to be fruitful and multiply on earth. But now they sought it out through the intercession of the church with its closed windows. At one point, the priest said, it is important to be married before God. And so I wonder, when did God finally marry his God? And where did people think God was the day before? These stories, all true and wonderful, that happened in just a couple of days, I hope are useful to see what may happen in the world when we separate our spiritual experiences inside and outside of the temple. When we call one place or creature sacred and leave another empty of spiritual meaning, care, and support. Or when we forget that God is also, as he has already said, creator. Therefore, is somehow also present in the natural world, outside of the temple, in the spider web. What does that mean? How do we live that out in our moral choices, the way we are church, our ministers, the way we worship, and God? How do we include the earth in our worship experience? How can we feel the earth as our name? What does Christ have to do with all of this? Can we be faithful to the earth and God at the same time? These stories also help us see what happens when we want to save the earth but also forget about the throne of the poor, the human poor. Or what happens when we want to save the earth, and that's all very nice, until we realize that the diversity of cultures and peoples and religions, regardless of their legal status, are also part of God's creation. How do we deal with our differences then? How do we recognize our common desire and divine right to search for well-being, prosperity, love, health, and justice? We say we believe in the Creator God, but know very little, and we still struggle how to love God's creation. The writer of 1 John in the New Testament says, no one has ever seen God. But if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. That word, one another, today more than ever, needs to include the whole earth. My experience and concern with for the issues of creation care comes from the Christian tradition. And that is where I have been looking for answers. Especially after realizing in my younger years that adopting indigenous spirituality was not helping me convince church folks that we needed to care for the earth. It was not enough for who have ears that could listen. So I began to reach, to research, and to see that we share with others the story of Noah in Genesis 9. Noah was neither Hebrew nor a Jew, much less a Christian. His legend or story belongs to all humanity. The covenant that God made that day and the rainbow is the eternal sign was with Noah 
with his family, his descendants, and with all of creation, which includes all of us, all people, and beyond. I have been involved in eco justice ministry for 22 years now, and I have found how within our Christianity, Christian community, we don't usually know the link between God, our faith, and the rest of the earth. So, killing the spider because we fear it, or because it just doesn't seem useful to us enough, doesn't become a concern. Drinking bottled water, regardless of whether we recycle the bottle or not, how it was produced, or well we'll end up, doesn't become a spiritual concern. Seeking our prosperity and well-being, regardless of the environmental impact in the rest of the world, or our own health, may be an environmental concern and sometimes political, but it doesn't easily become a spiritual concern. But I would like to argue that these are all spiritual concerns, and that the ecological crisis, in many ways, is a vocation, is a vocational spiritual crisis. When Judeo-Christians look inward into our own faith, inspired by a concern for the state of the natural world, or a concern about the difficulties that some of us have to bring our spiritual experience in nature within the realm of the institutional church, we are presently surprised to see that there is a lot in our tradition that can guide and support our eco-spirituality and work, even though it has been forgotten. Where is God? Outside? Dancing? At a wedding? Or from a wedding? Or also sitting on the pews, on a train across the forest with closed windows to keep away the wind and the mountain creatures? Where is God? In the temple? In the bread and the wine that is only served to those baptized? The answers that each of us may have to these questions I've seen that determine a great deal our behavior towards the human and the non human world. The answers that are. One Easter morning when my oldest son was four years old and I was still going to seminary, he brought me a drawing he had made and in it he had drawn Jesus on the cross the bottom of the cross there were also small animals and crawling creatures. To the left of Jesus there was an angel flying and all over Jesus also there was a big colorful rainbow. The theme of my son's painting was full of eco spirituality. The cross, the angel, the other creatures, the rainbow and Jesus himself were all part and all part of the same story, not of simple stories. What we call the natural world and the spiritual world exist together as one. The good news of Jesus Christ had no intention to deny other creatures, other cultures, other temples, other stories. All are part of the story of God's creation, one God, one earth. The, sure, the, the earth we share is possible only through the sustaining presence of the spirit of the one God. <coughs> It is God who gives life to all that exists in heaven and on earth. For the Spirit creates, unites, makes beauty, and brings forth life in the world. The spider, you and I, all live because God's breath is in us, the same as the truth. So the world is spirit-filled, regardless of whether sometimes we recognize it or not. That is why a bird or a lily in the field can teach us. That is why the writer of the Gospel of Luke was not fearful when he said at the moment of Jesus' baptism that the Holy Spirit came down on Jesus in the form of a dove. Oh, a dove. That is why we hear God's message being spoken from a cloud or a burning bush in the Exodus. Or we hear about the prophet Elijah being fed by ravens when he was in the desert, the first king. It is in the Western world that we have learned to fear confusing God's creator with God's creature. And this has led many of 
away from appreciating the sacred in the natural world.
beyond Jesus himself. So we can find hope in creation. From this worldview, theology, it is safe to say for Christians that it is Christ who makes it possible for creation to be a channel of God's grace. Grace for us.